just like you saw right there. <laughs> Lots of things to get to today. Our panel, uh, our good friend, Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Kip Two, and, of course, Republican Joy Fox, of our course. political analyst, mm-hmm. are taking a little bit of time off for a summer vacation. So, gentlemen, always good to have you all here. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for the invitation. Good to see you Glad to be here. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, big news item of the week is, of course, what happened uh, up in Karma at the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council, uh, the Shiny Up Synagogue. Uh, someone left a, you know, Spray painted a swatch sticker, iron crosses. This has led to a discussion uh, about hate crimes and the community coming together. Uh, Kip, let me start with you. Uh, your thoughts, your reaction to what we saw this week? Well, you know, it's not the first time we've had incidents like that in the state of Indiana. It is the first time I think the governor has reacted, and I'm glad he's finally reacting, and hopefully he's going to pull, drag, do whatever he needs to do to the Republican Party in the state of Indiana into the 21st century, and that we become uh, one of the what is it, 45 states, 44 states that have a a hate crimes law. We obviously need one, um, and it's it's past time that we get one. Joey, uh, will Republicans, because this has always been an issue, uh, poor Republicans, that whole sort of hate crime they think is kind of, you know, punishing thought, and the statute has enough provisions saying this was, you know, vandalism, uh, with some of the burnings that we saw, maybe attempted arson, that that the law is currently sufficient enough to to take care of all this, that, that graffiti was found at the cemetery, at the synagogue, rather. So, and I'm really sensitive to to that argument on what 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 is the crime that has been committed, a vandal, vandalism, a murder, versus what is the what is the thought of the person that is that is committing it. However, I think that given that there are 46 states, it's 45 or 46 from what Kip said, we, that that have done this. I think there are probably enough models um, that are out there of how to make this how to make this work effectively, and I, I'm confident that. Uh, Senator Bray and Speaker Bosma and the governor will lead a, lead a discussion of how we do this in, in a way that, that protects everybody and sends a message uh, that we are going to be protecting uh, minorities in this in minorities in this state that we're not going to we can't just let this stuff keep happening without any kind of retribution from the state you see but i argue that, that it's not just protecting minorities it's protecting everybody because if it's you know race is part of the factor you know whether you're white or black it's still, you know, based on race, religion. Uh, Brad, let me get you in here because uh, I know you've always been kind of a little skeptical of hate crimes in the sense that are we basically setting one set of class of people over another set of class of people? First, let me say for the record, I hate hate crimes. <laughs> uh, and second, this is coming from somebody bold. They're bold. Uh, <laughs> hey, my grandmother had a cross burn on our front yard, so wow. I'm two generations separated from having that happen. But I think crimes against people, crimes against property, it doesn't matter what the motivator is. It is a crime, and all crimes should be in, um, should be investigated, and then the laws should be enforced. We don't need more laws. We just need to enforce the ones we have. Somebody's motivation and getting in their brain, suddenly that gets real dicey on, yeah. you know, are, are we going to, yeah, are certain people more worthy of being protected than others? And I don't think we want to go down that path. Well, the, 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 I understand that argument and, and have some sympathy to that argument, no question about it, except for the fact that what happens in these instances is what permeates the culture, and it, uh, it becomes – then the minorities who are targeted feel less safe, the community feels less safe, um, because a crime is committed that is done in the name of the hate, right? And so I, I understand your position, and like I said, but it, it – you have to, I think, look at what is the uh, the consequence of the crime that is committed. It's not just a vandalism. I mean, if it was just a vandalism, you know, if someone had had gone to the Antelope Club and said, you guys are a bunch of elitists and, ty- and spray painted that on the thing, well, I don't think that first- would offend you as much. <laughs> as, <laughs> right? or, would, or would cause, or would cause uh, fear inside the antelope club, Well, I would right? think historically some groups probably did not get the full full uh, resources of any sort of investigating agency in the past, and I think yeah. that's what makes people scared of, all right, if this happens to me, are people going to take this seriously? I think we've hit the point now where we're taking it seriously. We just need to make sure that we're following up. Well, let me ask you gentlemen this, and anyone feel free to jump in. Uh, should Let's say lawmakers decide, all right, we're going to you know throw in, quote, unquote, hate bias crimes. The big question is, should it be a separate offense 
or should it be an enhanced penalty? Because right now we already have sort of, you know, if you look at the statute, right. aggravating factors of you know, person over 65, children, you know, a caregiver who assaults someone who is, who is in their care. We look at the, the heinousness of the, of the crime and the offense. We, we have these already. Uh, Joey, let me start with you. You know, is that how, if lawmakers do do some sort of, quote, hate or bias crime, should it be a separate offense or just an enhancement for, you know, the, the underlying offense, would you say be vandalism or assault? So let me say first, I haven't I haven't put a lot of thought into that into that question. My my gut my gut reaction is that it's an enhancement because you, in trying to stick as closely as we can, if we're going to go down this route, I want to stick as close as we can to punishing the crime that was committed, and so that that would be an an enhancement to it. Seems to make the most sense as I kind of talk this talk this through now. But I'll I'll reserve my right to come back later and, and change my mind. Kip, let me ask you as the other lawyer uh, in the room is is that how the you know, how do you think these things should work? You know, should the should the hate crime be a separate offense unto itself? Or or at an enhancement or aggravator uh, for the underlying offense. Well, I think either way works. So, uh, I, you know, hopefully the legislature is going to come up with a way to do it so that when people are looking at the state of Indiana to make investment and to do those types of things, they look at it as one of the uh, vast majority of states that that looks upon this the way it ought to look upon it. And I'm open to whatever way that is. But, you know, <laughs> I just think that we do not look good to the rest of the country when we're one of only five states that don't have it. Let me ask you, Brad. How, let's say lawmakers do it, because like I said, right now, we already have sort of you know, aggravated and mitigating factors for all sorts of offenses you know, in the criminal code. And, and to a certain degree, we do punish thought in the sense that we look at intent. You know, if I bump into you, did I mean to bump into you, or was it just an accident? I would probably agree with Joey and to some degree Kip on this, that an enhancement is probably the way to go. If that's the path that we're going to go down, I still don't think it's necessary. Um, but if you're going to do that, I think an enhancement as opposed to having a standalone crime that you could be charged for regardless of the vandalism or property damage. I... Because cause I think the other the other piece here, right, with, if, if it's a separate crime, I get really nervous with, you know, depends on who's in the government, right? You know, I'm, I'm not sure we want the government to then be able to say, just charge you with a crime for something that you thought. I, 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 that makes me very uncomfortable. You're watching Indiana Issues, uh, the online public affairs television program where we look at the big issues of the day. Our guests today are Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Kip Two, and Republican Joey Fox. Uh, also, gentlemen, this week, uh, State Senator Andy Zay uh, sort of got in the news for, ironically, comments made three years ago. Uh, he wrote in a sort of a Facebook exchange message, quote, uh, racism isn't real and lamented the plight of the white male, like I said, in a three-year Facebook discussion. He wasn't a senator at the time. This was a private discussion. His political opponent, Gary Snyder, who's running on the Democratic side, has, has sort of made hay of this. Uh, Joey, let me start with you. Uh, and the plight of the white male, because you look really oppressed to me. <laughs> <laughs> let's have three white males talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so now, and and now, let's, now let's commence talking about this. Yeah, where's Jamar uh, and Mary Beth when I need them this week? <laughs> so in, in all of my work with Senator Zay, I've had no indication that he, he would feel this way. Obviously, the comment that racism isn't real is just incorrect, right? Racism is very real. Um, I, I think that from the statement that he's put out, he really regrets what he said uh, in in this, and um, I believe him to be a good American, to be a patriot, um, to not harbor any ill will toward toward anyone. But he he needed to clarify what he meant. Uh, I think he think he's done that, and now we've got to let his constituents sort it out from here. Also uh, on the screen is uh, Democratic State Senator Tim Lannon uh, that you're seeing right there, uh, who called and chastised uh, Senator Zay for his comments and also saying that this, once again, a uh, reason for hate, bias, crime here in Indiana, and also called for diversity training uh, in the legislature, both lawmakers as well as uh, for employee staff. Uh, Brad, you and I both know uh, Andy Zay is also a member of the Antelope Club, you know, a private club we all belong to. I've never. I been do not. The, belong to the <laughs> you do not belong. We can fix that, Kip. I'm not. <laughs> an, I'm not a member of the elite. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> just, just a different kind of elitist. <laughs> Limousine liberal, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your thoughts on, like I said, with the the comments that were reported on this week. I've known Andy Zay, Senator Andy Zay, since long before he was a senator. Back when he was a uh, township board member in Huntington County. Um, there are certain people that are in the legislature that you just know kind of have an ax to grind and have an edge about them. Andy Zay is not that guy. Right. Um, yeah, in the context of the exchange, he probably could have used better wording. Um, 
I agree with Joey that, that racism does exist. I think it was kind of a dumb comment to make, but it was also in a private conversation and amongst lots of other comments that were being made. I think Andy's done a good job of, of kind of going backwards on that. Um, Andy's not a racist. I mean, it, that's, you know, he might have said something that was dumb, but I, I, I've known him long enough and I know him well enough to know that that's not him. And also, uh, Kim, I think it was interesting because part of that sort of Facebook email mess exchange, there were like 25 posts and exchange all together, and I actually kind of sat down and read through all of them, and toward the end, he seemed to kind of redeem himself uh, a little bit. Are we now in a universe where anything we write, say, anybody can take, can take a small snippet of it, and now we're labeled and branded something that's probably not the full picture? Well, first of all, I don't think it's taking a small snippet when a guy says racism isn't real. That's, that, that statement stands alone. Uh, he says he, he didn't mean it uh, when pushed. I will, I will remind you when pushed. But he also said that the white male is the most discriminated uh, against in this country. And to me, it shows an incredible lack of understanding what's going on in the real world. Uh, he lives in a uh, – uh, he must live in a, in, a, in a bubble somewhere because um, – I got white privilege. I mean, I, and I know it. I'm, I'm well aware of it. I understand that uh, my skin color allows me to do things, allows me not to be in situations uh, where, I, where I, I get all kind of advantage from being a white male. The fact that he doesn't understand that uh, it is, is a tragedy, really. And, and I think that the only thing we know differently today is that Andy Zay believes it. I, I'm, I'm afraid there's other people in our legislature who also believe it. I think that what ought to happen is... The Republican Party in the state, the state Republican leader, the governor, the president pro tem of the Senate, uh, the new incoming leadership of the Senate need to denounce this type of language. They need to pass a hate crimes bill. We need to be seen as a, as a city and a state that does not continent this, does not, does not say this stuff is okay, right? And, and unfortunately, we have a president of the United States that feeds into this, this, kind, of, this kind of behavior. It's just getting worse and worse, and it's not good. Joey, uh, does this complicate the Republicans' universe in the sense that uh, you've got Andy Zay making these comments? We saw what happened uh, up in Carmel. And to a little bit of a lesser degree, you have the attorney general with his issues and problems, but he's also an African-American male, the only one, you know, statewide. And there is sort of that underbubble sentiment out there that, hey, you know, this black guy is being treated differently than maybe if it was a white lawmaker. Does this complicate the Republicans' universe, you know, on these issues of sensitive issues of race when you've got Chairman Kyle Huffer, you know, trying to reach out and, and grow the party, you know, and be more diverse? Well, look, I, I think there's there's a couple things here. First of all, I, I think that there's a difference, and I don't want to. I kept tried to conflate. I think two two issues that that may that maybe that maybe don't go go together in in all. For, for everybody here. There's one thing to agree that racism is real, and then there's a whole other conversation about white privilege that we can have you know, as, a, as, a, as a separate conversation. All I know okay. is that I'd like to I, have it. I'll, 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 you tell me what the difference is. Here, I'll, I will tell you this. The only thing I know about white privilege is that when I go to the Columbia Club, the white people open the door for me are very privileged <laughs> to have that job. That, that's all I can tell you about white privilege, but I'll let you finish. And I think that what we, what we need to focus on is treating people as individuals, as people of value. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your gender is, um, these kind of characteristics that we, we've, we've come to define ourselves with. What matters is that we need to be treated as human beings that have, that have value. And I think the Republican Party for a long time has stood for, stood for those values. I think we'll, we will come, come through this. I think the governor is showing great leadership um, on, the, on, the, on these issues, especially um, related to um, depending on where you stand on the Curtis Hill controversy and on the hate crimes legislation. So no, I, don't, I, think, I think the Republican Party will be fine. Brian, let me get you. Yeah, I don't know that this is party specific. Kip said something that, that made me think. We live in a day and age where we're getting more polarized, and I think it's because there's so much information available that instead of having one or two or three sources of news and they try to go down the middle as much as they can, you can now self-select yeah. whatever your source is, which will reinforce potentially your bias or give you the opportunity to learn more about others. And I think that it's incumbent on everybody to learn more about other people and understand where they're coming from instead of trying to insulate yourself. And, I mean, anybody can do it. it you, CNN, Fox News, Reason Magazine, we all have those news sources that will reinforce our bias and tell us what we think. But I think it's, it's on us. We need to get out and learn more about other people that we don't maybe fully understand who maybe don't live in our neighborhood. 
Hip, you need to turn off Rachel Maddow. <laughs> You'd be surprised to learn I don't hardly ever watch yeah. any of that stuff. <laughs> I don't. I can't take it. Yeah, you and I are 100% there. Uh, you're watching Indiana Issues, a place where you can actually find out you know, information from a different point of view. Uh, Libertarian Brad Klopenstein, Democrat Kip 2, Republican Joey Fox with us. Uh, gentlemen, uh, the Curtis Hill controversy continued again this week. Lawmakers demect, rejecting a demand uh, by Curtis Hill's attorneys to identify the individual who leaked uh, those comments and also to change that legislative report uh, that outlined accusations against the Attorney General uh, for alleged groping in a bar March 15th, the last day of session. Uh, Brad Kloppenstein, uh, is this just going to be a headache for Republicans for the forever? It, it is. I, it, and the more I look at this, the more I just think it's not going to end well for the Attorney General. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at his path to success and I don't see one, uh, but fortunately or unfortunately, the party doesn't support him and I think he feels like he's kind of dangling out there on his own so if he's going to go down he's going to take the party with him. Joe you're a Republican is this party going down? No. Um, I, the, the party, the party establishment is almost uniformly um, opposed to the Attorney General um, on this. Some of the uh, kind of bizarrely, I guess, the social conservative wing of the party has, has come to his defense. Uh, that person on the screen right there, so uh, Jim Bopp, a conservative lawmaker who's put together uh, sort of a 501c3 to help pay for the Attorney General's uh, legal defense fund. There you have it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I, I, tend to, I tend to agree with, with Brad in, in that I don't know how this, I don't know how you end this on, on a win. You can muscle your way through a controversy for so long, but who who votes for you, right? At, you know, at at the end of the at the end of the day, he's going to give this give this a give this a shot. He's continuing to run his office and continuing to, you know, be be out be out and about. But I, I just I still kind of I don't see the path here. Yep, you've seen the elected officials go through controversies before. Uh, not speaking specifically to the attorney general, but can they survive? Can they make a comeback? Yeah, and and in this instance, I think his play is that he's going to. A juxtapose this against it's the establishment. I think we've already seen that happening. I'm I'm taking on the establishment of the Republican Party, and uh, they're out to get me. This is all about uh, Governor Holcomb not wanting me to run against him the next time, and this this is what this is. Now, you know he's he's in some legal jeopardy. I don't think there's any uh, question about that. There's a special prosecutor that's looking at him, and and that that is a uh, uh, Damocles above his head, and some and potentially I I should say, um, and so. His uh, his strategy here could fall apart if if the special prosecutor decides or finds enough to prosecute, or if the legislature decides to impeach him, um, which they may or may not do. How much of this, gentlemen? Uh, I'd like to anybody jump in. Is this what I call a four sixty five story? That is predominantly dominates the news waves and the newspapers and the, and the ink and the print uh, here in the Indianapolis area. But the further you get out. Uh, the less people are talking about it. I gave a, a speech a couple weeks ago up in Delaware County and just talking to some of them. I was like, okay, how many guys you know, are familiar with the attorney general story? Like, well, I kind of heard about it, but for the most part, the further you get away, it's more about roads and schools and, and, and opioids. Yeah. And, and is that maybe the attorney general saving grace in the sense that it's it's a highly it's a big it's a big story here, but maybe not grace? necessarily for us. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> o- o- only, o- only until somebody runs runs ads. What, about this, right? I mean, it, until you start running pictures of the the three women who have who have publicly come forward, and there's uh, there's another another woman that is still uh, still anonymous in in the legislative report um, with with this. I mean, maybe folks outside the the bubble you know, don't know about it a lot now, but when he's when his name is on the ballot again, you can bet whoever's running against him, whether in a primary or the Democrat that runs against him for whatever office that. Everyone's going to know all about this story. But well, he's he's adopted the Trump strategy, right? Yes. I mean, on this and, and and so far inside the Republican base, the Trump strategy is the one that is holding forth, right? I mean, anybody who who uh, dares take on Trump gets uh, you know gets pretty well destroyed inside their party. So I think that's what he's up to. I, I will take you at your word. I haven't seen any polling that says you know in. Fort Wayne or Delaware County or Terre Haute, they're hearing about this stuff. And that's not that surprising because people have tuned out politics, I think in part because of Trump. There's some incredible Trump fatigue out there. Democrats, Republicans, independents, I don't, I think don't want to hear about politics right now because it's all Trump all the time. It's like we're all living in this reality show that we can't get our get out of. And so people have turned it off. But 
I think Joe is exactly right. If you get to a campaign time and this and he has to run, the question is going to be in a Republican primary, can he survive? I think he could survive a Republican primary, but he could not survive a general election with this stuff holding on over his right. head, I think. Well, and I believe he's nominated at convention. So he has yes. to survive a convention and not a primary. That's right. um, that's, a, that's a fair point. But, yeah. yeah. But, but convention goers tend to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I agree with you, Abdul, in that it's a bigger story inside of 465. That's the universe we all live in. That's the one we talk about. It's probably less of a story out state. I think Kip's right. Trump does suck almost all the political attention away from local politics or Indiana politics, which then gives Curtis Hill cover, as well as there's fewer and fewer news outlets out state that are giving any sort of coverage to the state house and what's going on in central Indiana. So he's got cover there. And you know what? There's, there's precedent where if you wait this out until an Andy's A story or some other story comes along and suddenly you're no longer the biggest story on the block, you can survive it. He's going to be wounded. He's probably not going to have the national stage he was hoping to have, but he could potentially survive. You're watching Indiana Issues, the public affairs program. We'll try to go beyond the headlines and sound bites and bring you uh, Indiana's news in the entirety. Brad Clapton, Sun Libertarian, Democrat, Kip 2, Republican, Joy Fox, our guest. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we're less than 100 days away from the midterm elections. Yay. I can just see how excited you all are. <laughs> I am, if I'm not showing it. <laughs> right now. Uh, you've got Republicans bragging in emails uh, that they've knocked on, reached more 90,000 more voters than Democrats. Democrats bragging that they're running uh, races in 90% of all the one. 125 sort of state-related uh, offices. we got Mike Braun and Joe Donnelly statistically uh, tied. Uh, Joey, let me start with you. Uh, how are things looking so far? I think the Republicans are in pretty good shape um, here move, moving forward. I, I think that there's some, anal there's some analysis um, that Trevor Foudy did that I think, Kip, you commented on as, as, as well, um, looking at how Democratic waves get muted a lot in, 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 in Indiana. And so I think even with what we may see nationally, I, I still think you're going to see you're going to have solid majorities in the House uh, and in the Senate in in the Indiana legislature. I think on the Senate race, um, the Democrats strategy of going after all of the after they've decided they're opposed to President Trump's nominee for Supreme Court to then say, well, now we want all the documents, even though we're opposed to him. And now it looks like that's going to push everything, push the timeline back into October uh, before everything can be produced and, and, and reviewed. And so I, I think that uh, the confirmation of Judge Kavanaugh either shortly before or shortly after uh, the election is going to continue to put tremendous pressure uh, on, on Senator Donnelly. Um, yeah, I have the opposite take with respect to that. Uh, sorry to jump in before you could ask your question, but I think it's an easy vote for Senator Donnelly. Um, I don't think, I, you know, uh, off-year elections are generally base votes, exciting your base. There is a middle, and I don't think the middle cares about uh, Judge Kavanaugh. That is something that both bases care about. So for him, I think it's an easy vote. He's not going to get a bunch of Republican votes if he votes for Judge Kavanaugh, they're going to vote for Mike Braun because he's a Republican. And so he, uh, to me, it's not that it's not going to be a big deal one way or the other. He should vote no on Kavanaugh, and it won't it won't harm him any in any way. He already voted for he already voted for uh, Neil Gorsuch, so I think he's okay there. But with with respect to your other question about we're 100 days out and what what's the what's the you know the play, I was uh, out in. Uh, at a conference this week, uh, had a chance to sit down with a, a national pollster who does some polling in Indiana. They do it all over the country. Um, and it was an interesting conversation. And it's part of what I said earlier. She said most of the people, she's doing focus groups, she's doing all these things, most of the people are so sick of hearing about Donald Trump that they've tuned out. The question is going to be, uh, at the end of this election cycle, all of the all of the factors are there for a huge Democratic wave. The question is going to be what's going to happen in the last three weeks in this campaign. Is it going to be a big wave or a mild wave? We don't know yet. But as far as fundraising goes, as far as Democratic enthusiasm goes, as far as um, all the special elections that have gone since Donald Trump, all of those indications – lead to a big wave. And I'm just talking about historically, when you look at all the factors, all of those factors are in place for a big wave. My party is perfectly capable of screwing it up at the end. Um, they have before. <laughs> um, but I, I, my prediction sitting here today is it's going to be as big as 74. Right, we've just got a couple minutes left. Let me get you in here real quick here. Uh, I, I do kind of agree with Kip that it's the Democrats to lose 
the cycle around. I'd I'd like to hear how many avails are left on TV stations in the last hundred days for uh, pretty commercials because I think I opened my refrigerator this morning and saw a Donnelly ad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they the, the, that you center, got one of those smart refrigerators. Yeah, right exactly. Yeah, it shows you what's inside. Yeah. Uh, Joe Donnelly was in there <laughs> looking for my vote. So. <laughs> so I, I think that that's the U.S. Senate race here is going to dominate the discussion and the airwaves, and it's going to be hard for anybody else who's running for any sort of local office to get any kind of traction because there's just not going to be availability on traditional media. So you're going to have to get real non-traditional. Well, I, I, I would say with respect to that, I think fewer and fewer uh, elections are being decided on TV. Yeah. So uh, the, the opportunity exists in, other, in, dig, in digital and other places to communicate. Uh, real quick, gentlemen, before we, we can't uh, escape <laughs> <laughs> something I noticed, uh, particularly with all the emails and you know, just sort of messaging, it, it seems like you know, Kip, you're right. You no, know, the midterm elections tend to be base elections, and that's who Republicans and Democrats are actually advertising to. You know, when Republicans say, "Hey, make Joe Donnelly support Neil Gorsuch," when Joe Donnelly says, "Hey, we don't want to take your health care away," it seems that the, the the middle voter they're being totally ignored right now. This is about keeping the base. Well, Ration up and gend up. I would say that the health care message that Donnelly is, is sending out there is actually not just to the base. It's actually to the middle. It's to the people that are actually getting benefits from health care reform. Interestingly enough, I mean, two years ago, a Democrat wouldn't have sent that message out because Obamacare was not popular. But now people don't want their health care uh, insurance taken away from them. And he's, he's not just talking to the base. He's talking to the middle. Some folks would like to be able to afford their health insurance again. Yeah, it would be nice. Uh, we got about 90 seconds left, gentlemen, so I want to uh, get your political predictions and prognostications in. Joey, we'll start with you. What are you paying attention to uh, going forward? I'm, I'm all in on, on Judge Kavanaugh. I'm, I'm watching and want to see uh, what Donnelly does and how that uh, impacts the race here. Yep. I'm watching it all. I, I, I can't tell you that there's one thing in particular. I, well, I guess I would say the, the um, Trey Hollingsworth, um, uh, Liz, Liz, Watson, Watson. Liz Watson race, Mel Hall mm -hmm. versus... Um, Jackie Wolowski, I think those two are going to be uh, important to watch, and both both have gone from gone to red to blue. Um, uh, that's a program. I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast, but it, Democrats and the national folks are looking at both of those seats as saying they they could flip in a wave. So. Brett? Uh, certainly, I'm looking to see if libertarians can capitalize on the record vote totals from two years ago. Uh, obviously, it's a big year. Secretary of State Mark Rutherford's running. If he gets 10%, suddenly libertarians are in the in the primary elections moving forward for the next four years, which I think is really big for the party. Um, the question is, is he going to be able to get enough attention to, to garner the votes needed to get to that 10%? So we'll see. All right. Well, our guests today have been Libertarian Brad Kloppenstein, Democrat Kip Two, Republican Joy Fox. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for being with us. Thanks, thank Abdul. Special thanks to all the good folks here at Edge Media Studios in downtown Indianapolis for hosting us today. Bills will be sure to check them out. And that will do it for this edition of Indiana Issues. I'm Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. Thank you very much for being with us, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks here on Indiana Issues.